Thank you so much for the RT for hosting us. Uh, you know, it's been great. I mean, there's been some. Uh, some world premieres driven by uh, a VRT. If you haven't looked uh, yet, go on YouTube, type uh, VRT, VR, news, and you'll see on YouTube the great work that has been done, you know, trying to push the media for the first time, come up with a, a new way of thinking on media, and uh, news, uh, news briefs are represented in, in 360. So that was very, uh, very inspiring. Um, I'm not going to go very long on the agenda because uh, it's very ambitious, but you understood that the team of tonight is social. Now, why have we picked up that team? Uh, well, one, because being social, this community is growing. Uh, since the last meetup, we've grown by 13%. Uh, we are now at uh, uh, 1,100 people uh, in the community. Uh, if you're a member of the meetup, you probably saw that we're organizing now trainings, we're organizing hackathons, we're organizing all type of activities. And so we hope to continue these trends of uh, uh, of activating uh, of VR. Uh, we know also uh, among the leading um, VR ecosystem, just be aware that Amsterdam is, is probably going to catch us up very soon. Um, that's okay, that's okay, it's just uh, you know how things go. But um, we have great contact with them and there's definitely going to be opportunities for the, for the future to collaborate with, uh, uh, with the Dutch, we absolutely uh, love. Uh, you know, virtual reality, it's, it's a slide I like to, you know, just look back, it's, it involves computer, which is good. And um, it is the, uh, this idea that you can recreate a synthetic uh, reality, a synthetic environment. And when you think of it, you know, all, we, all we feel, all the emotions we have, contribute to the, the feeling of presence, the feeling of being here and there, uh, here at this point of, uh, of space, and now at this point of time. And uh, one of the greatest um, impact that VR can have is to bring people closer to one another. I'll tell you a story. Is that I've had the chance to early on try some of the Oculus demo about social. And I, I was impressed, but not that much. Uh, recently, there was a, a silly game that was released on the HTC Vive, and basically you play pool. And uh, it's a social experience. So imagine yourself, the, the VR environment is just a cafe, you play pool and then an avatar comes up and then you have to play with that avatar and and initially when you play a video game or if you play a video game you, you you don't care so much about the other players they're, they're just a virtual being you know something to compete or fight against and in vr there's an ease that grows once you have this sort of avatar and you realize it's a person and you can feel their presence suddenly you feel the need to chit chat you feel the need to socialize and make conversation and get to know the other person. All things that I've personally never experienced on a computer, suddenly in VR, you start to have emotions, you start to have social behaviors in a platform which is a very synthetic. Obviously, the fact that Facebook bought Oculus is a sign that there's huge potential in, in VR being used as a social media. Uh, just to reassure you about the skeptics, the industry is growing, and every month, if you look at that slide, it's uh, organized by um, a, a venture funds uh, called uh, the VR Fund. Uh, so they keep updated the ecosystem worldwide. Uh, this ecosystem keeps on growing, growing. So definitely, a lot of industries, a lot of different people are showing up interest. I've been asked to ask the questions to the public: How many of you are involved with um, filmmaking? Filmmaking, okay, so that basically all the people there in the, mi in the middle are in filmmaking, so some of you want to network with, with, with each other, so uh, filmmaking people, again, okay, look at each other, you get a chance to talk to each other. Okay, <coughs> Who's, who is doing video games? <coughs> video games in VR? Okay, okay, okay. Who is doing uh, B2B VR or, okay, okay, uh, VR advertising? VR advertising, how would you call it, VR scene or something? Any field that I forgot that you feel passionate about, okay? Healthcare. Healthcare, who's Sex. doing healthcare? Okay, who's doing uh, real estate? Sex industry. Who is doing, who's doing porn, VR porn, okay, three, good. Those guys are gonna be popular tonight. Healthcare, yes. Healthcare, yeah. <laughs> that, that is the type of healthcare. And, uh, and for sure you'll feel presence with that type of content. 
Um, one announcement you've all seen on your chair that there's a little bit leaflet there. And uh, earlier last year, we or this year, earlier this year, we organized a VR hackathon on on VR, but we had no thematic. We don't, didn't have any specific approach. This time around, we want to focus on business to business application. So we, we want to deter people from just doing pure entertainment, and we want to encourage them to use VR as a way to disturb existing business model, existing industry, just by using all the elements of VR that make it uh, super special. So we expect to have about 90 people attending the event. Uh, it's going to be a mix between a startup weekend and a VR hackathon, meaning people are going to pitch their business ideas, then people are going to select the best ideas, and then groups of VR technical people and business people are going to gather together, work on the business model, work on a minimum viable product, and then at the end of the weekend, they're going to present their VR startup as a sustainable business, where VR is the enabler of the whole business. And so we have great people, we have four people coming from uh, the USA just to attend this, um, this meetup. We have people from the Netherlands, from Germany, from UK, from Portugal, from Sweden. So it's going to be a very, again, European event, but a, a great opportunity to meet super cool people. So if you know people that have great business sense, that know nothing about VR, but you think would make a lot of sense to uh, uh, consider that medium, please tell them about this event. And if, if yourself as a VR enthusiast and you know want to spend a great weekend building a, a cool startup, please uh, join us. Uh, this event would not have been possible uh, without the help of uh, an amazing individual that joined my team a few months ago, which is uh, Marina Varlon. She is the community manager of the, the Belgian VR uh, community. Uh, she's part of my team working on, on audiovisual. So I'd like uh, to give uh, her the word to present uh, the next slides. So, Marine, please uh, join me. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to see a lot of people coming to the meetup and a lot of enthusiasm around VR, as we are all. So, what we do for um, VR people? Uh, we do a lot, actually. Um, we, we just saw that we do a lot of events, like meetups and hackathons. <coughs> uh, we can also help you to inform you um, through our um, Facebook page, our Twitter account, and we do a newsletter um, every two weeks. We also organize meetups, as you can see, uh, labs. Uh, Tanguy is around here, so if you have questions around labs, you can ask him. We do hackathon, and we support a company, so if you have questions regarding your business or regarding um, VR in general, you can get back to us. We will be very happy to help you and to, to grow your business. One. Um, as I said, we do events, and so a uh, big event that we organized uh, this year in June was the VR Festival, Experience VR. It was the first uh, VR festival, cinematic VR festival in Brussels, so in, even in Belgium. So that's what we do in June, and we were very proud of it because we had a lot of people and a lot of food press. Uh, a little bit far away, that's what I do in Liège. It's a festival dedicated to transmedia, web series, and of course VR. And so it will be held on October 27, 28, and 29, and you're more than welcome to join. We will have a cinematic VR um, cinema, uh, meetings, uh, conferences, uh, and screenings. So yeah, basically that's it, that's what we do. And I also heard that some enthusiasm around Paul in VR, so maybe we can do a meetup around Paul soon, <laughs> if you want to. It's an invitation. Uh, oh, okay, and I forgot to see <laughs> also something. Um, as you can see, I'm really interested in festivals, and that's why I'm really happy to welcome Verne, uh, which will do a talk about VR and uh, festivals. Woo! Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, almost night. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Fredo. Thank you, Marine and Juan. 
it's a pleasure to be here and uh, it's an honor to provide a kind of kickoff of this conference. I will introduce myself, but first let's start with a little video and that's made by Laura Chen. And it should be sound. She's producing daily live uh, VR, a web VR series about the most daily essential, most essential daily life issues like eat, sleep, and poo. Um, I think virtual mini worlds that allow people to join in the usually solitary environments, and now we can share it all together. And I highly recommend you all guys to watch it in your own time, all the chapters, because they're really funny. But for night, the keyword is communal experiences. <coughs> so, because do we really want to share everything in VR? Like our private habits. And what kind of shared experience do we want to have? Virtual reality could sometimes feel very introvert for some of us, the critical ones. But luckily, VR producers also started with exploring the benefits of the social element of VR. Not necessarily uh, social as in social media, but more social as in getting the opportunity to dive into the world of someone else, dive into the, the yeah, unknown worlds. Um, sometimes even together with other users. And that's the point I want to make tonight. So I'm Veerle de Vrede. I'm, um, Curator of Visuals Art. I am uh, initiator of several art and new media festivals. I'm co curator of the Doc Lab events uh, in Amsterdam. And I'm um, currently I'm also developing the uh, artistic program of a brand new festival, a VR festival, that will take place in Gaunt in spring 2017. And I guess it will be really fun, but that's it. I can tell you only that because the rest is still top secret, but you know. Um, so because I can't talk about that festival, let's talk about Dog Club. And just to check, what is some of you ever, did someone visit ever the Dog Club events in Amsterdam? So it's all about non-fiction storytelling. And uh, let me give you a brief introduction. This is during a live, or this is during a conference where we did a crowd assessment where everybody had to scream for an interactive story and um, Dog Lab is the new media program of ITFA and it's the non of yeah, the, the biggest documentary festival all, all over the world and during ITFA um, the, all the Dog Lab events are taking place in the Brakke Grond, Flemish House of Culture in the Netherlands and that's always that's the reason why there's always a strong connection between Dog Lab and Belgium so that's good for you to know. At Dog Club, we show interactive documentaries and all new digital platforms to actually to push the boundaries to its limits of non-fiction storytelling in the age of the interface. And projects are curated and presented in live events, conferences, exhibitions, and workshops. This project that was one of the highlights <coughs> last year, Famous Death. Um, what would it be um, of what exactly did John F. Kennedy, uh, Whitney Houston, Lady Di and Gaddafi experience right before the death? 
what would it have been like to be there? Uh, we don't know, but their memory is still wandering around because because all the images we once saw. And we can only speculate about what they what their last moments were, but you need the courage to step, step in one, into one of the mortuary chests, locked up in darkness, and then immerse yourself in a sound and fragrance documentary of their last uh, minutes. And I can tell you it was very impressive. This was a high find experiment together with all the audience. Um, over the last three years, we focused at DocLab at the exciting new frontiers of hand-drawn virtual reality. We address a variety of challenges and opportunities of virtual reality during the exhibition and during the live events. And that's not easy at all because it's quite difficult to explain virtual reality to a big audience. And to give you an idea, the festival is during 10 days and during the 10 days we will welcome more than 9,000 visitors and we are showing more or less six, 60 projects. So it's a big job. This was the exhibition two years ago. I guess for all of us in the room, um, the word virtual reality might sound a bit old to it. But we tend to forget it's actually an unexplored universe. Um, it's quite unexplored. It's also easy to miss out the fact that at its core, it's not just about technique, but it's about people. And that's what the thing we want to make clear during the exhibition, because among all the new releases of the latest hardware, we make VR, you know, what, that, what makes VR so exciting that has as much as to do with art as it has to do with technique and science. This project was shown in the exhibition, and you will see also how we show it in a live event. So, um, this, this is something we want to stress uh, in our exhibitions. On the one hand, we want to show the most remarkable projects that are technically superb, but on the other hand, we are also very keen to give a platform to projects that are exploring the boundaries that aren't <coughs> technically that, that well done, but they are interesting because it's a new way to explore how to use ex VR. So this was during a live event. Um, we just, because we only just beginning to figure out the potential of VR as a storytelling medium. So many of the rules, the techniques, the conventions, uh, they, we, are all, they, we, we take them all for granted in film and in theater, but we have to explore them in, in new media, in the, we have to explore them what we can do, for, how we can use it in virtual reality. And it's still about content. It's the quality of content remains still the biggest challenge for immersive reality. So how can we effectively connect the virtual world to the real world? I will introduce you to three different projects that we all showed at DocLab, and they, they're different because they all had another way to invite people to, to participate and to share, share their experience in different ways. Let's start with Project Recover Mozul, and it's Recover with VR Mozul. It's a virtual environment that brings back the um, historical collection of the Mosul Museum, museum in Iraq that's raised by the ES in 2014. And this video clip will show, it will explain it the best. On the 26th of February 2015, the militant group known as Islamic State posted an online video. It showed the destruction of antiquities in and around the Central Museum at Mosul in northern Iraq. Losing this material matters to all of us in terms of our knowledge of who we are and where we've come from. Welcome to Recover Mosul, the virtual Mosul Museum. Project Mosul was born from the idea that modern technology might be able to offer the past a future. 
hey, we could do crowdsourcing here, find the imagery from the public and actually begin to do photogrammetric reconstructions, take photos that have different angles, different perspectives of an object, and be able to create a three-dimensional model. We were ordered by our prophet to take down idols and destroy them. These religious justifications are just camouflage for um, economic plunder. Who owns this new heritage that's being created? To create a virtual reality object, you have to look at it. You really have to look at it. Only then do you understand. So, Recover Mozilla, our collective reconstruction. It's a virtual reality create, created in response to this destruction and allowing us to visit the museum and find out what happened to its key pieces. While walking through the uh, museum, we see the, art, uh, the destroyed artifacts and they are digitally reconstructed by crowdsourced imagery. The virtual environment was created by the new media artists Ziv Snyder and Laura Chen. We saw Laura Chen before <coughs> with completely different content. And um, this was the result, the, the, uh, the resulting VR experience was first shown at Dunk Club. And it also includes some uh, physically uh, artifacts uh, printed by 3D techniques. And as the voiceover in the, in the movie to, uh, said, already said, this is modern technology made it possible perhaps to offer the past future. I think a beautiful example. Another VR project we showed during the same exhibition was The Enemy, and The Enemy made by Karim Ben Khalifa. Um, perhaps some of you went to the WebDocs conference uh, last year, of no, in the spring of 2015, and uh, Karim Ben Khalifa was going to give a keynote about this project, but unfortunately he had to cancel last minute his acte de présence. And so let me give you some insights in insights into this project. And also again let's start with a video clip. This project was born out of frustration as a photo journalist. I have covered conflicts for the last 15 years, and I knew I could not just do the same when I became a father. Yet, I was not done with trying to understand wars. My friend in Israel, when they know I'm heading for Gaza, cannot help themselves but to wish me luck and to stay safe. They believe a lot of people in Gaza are irrational. But also when I spend weeks in Gaza working, and I'm about to return to Israel, my Palestinian friends are telling me exactly the same. Just be careful there. So there is a bigger story than the war itself, and perhaps this is the one I need to explore and share. This project is rooted in my experience covering from one side to the other in many different wars and conflicts, finding that people's dreams, hopes and nightmares are often more similar than they are different. Who's your enemy? For the audience to understand and feel that, we will use artificial intelligence, cognitive science, and the latest technologies in virtual realities. Here is the concept. The Oculus Rift is a virtual reality headset. It blocks your vision and places you in a virtual world that we are creating. Fox Harrow, a professor, and Emil Bruno, a researcher, both from the MIT, will provide the analytical backbone. When the audience walks in between enemies, we will measure bias and how they physiologically respond to the installation. And in using neuroscience research, we could be able to discover how much empathy has been created. I am planning to bring the fighters of seven other long-standing conflicts together in the very same way. You create an enemy as a kid without having met your enemy because a society around you has created an enemy in the other. So the question is, could I be you if I was on the other side?
premiere of uh, this, the enemy was also during the dog club exhibition, and we showed it like this in the exhibition. And of course, you have to test it yourself if, to immerse yourself in it. And this immersive installation uh, uses VR to make the audience part of a conversation between two soldiers from the opposite side of a uh, long standing global conflict. And Ben Khalifa uh, collaborated with the MIT to integrate uh, cognitive cognitive science and uh, artificial, artificial intelligence uh, in, uh, interaction models to int they integrated in this project to engender empathy. And this was during a live event, so we had the opportunity to sit there with 140 people in the audience and sit in front of a, of a soldier while Karim was telling about the making of this project. And it was an intense night. And the final project I want to introduce you is a project that we show, showed a year before in 2014. It's the machine to be another, and it's uh, made by the art collective Be Another Lab. And they ask questions like, what would it be like to be for a woman to live in the body of a man? Or what is it for a fit, uh, physically fit jogger? Uh, to find out to be a wheelchair bound or what would it be to live in the body of if you are a black person to live in the body of a white person of course we can read about it and we can uh, talk about it but it's completely something completely else to dive into the world of someone else and the machine to be another was offers you the opportunity to do just that and the video I will show you gives a good illustration. The video is, the quality is bad and the music is also a bit, but it's a good explanation. Let's see. Because you could test it yourself in the exhibition, I could think you could imagine it was a big, big hit. The queue was enormous. Um, and this project is really interesting because it's based on really low, low budget stuff, low budget experiments in virtual extensions to give you the access to the body, but also to the mind of someone, of someone else. And this installation cost. Um, internationally operated in the in the 
and uh, experimental anthropology and gender and gay studies because it gives you the opportunity to it's it's a new approach to um, understanding identity and I showed you three different projects that all try to engender empathy for someone else for the situation of someone else and but still the experience are really individualistic um, and that's a challenge and this is the reason why I also come back to this picture because we did this in this last year and it was a unique moment uh, in one venue 50 more or less I guess 60 people uh, were sitting in the same room and were watching at the same time a, a, a VR experiment and it was quite difficult to arrange all the equipment, etc. But it was really November 2015, and now it's already September 2016. It's much more easy to arrange this kind of settings. There are many VR cinemas already. Um, I think we won't do this experiment again because it's not that interesting. It's not an interesting uh, collective experiment. It's too individualistic. So that's the reason why this year, in November, 2016. We um, are in a co-creation together with several VR makers and the National Theatre of London. And it's the aim to create a new uh, VR experiment where all people in the same room will be part of a real-time VR story. Um, perhaps it's going to be a real mindfuck, perhaps it's going to be a real collective experience, who knows, we, we see, we'll see, but I think this is at this time it's important that we try this kind of experiment and there's a lot to be excited about so let's try to uh, to if it works so after showing you these examples of important projects and stories that all immerse you in the world of someone else um, I think we all agree that those these human uh, stories that couldn't be told within another medium so perhaps we can talk about virtual reality as an empathy machine. But do they lead to empathy? And if you define empathy as knowing and feeling what another pe person knows and feels, of course VR stories, some VR stories do, but so do books, so do some uh, radio programs, movies, etc. Each in their own way. So saying VR is an empathy machine is saying a paintbrush is an art machine. There are myriad ways to uh, generate aspects of empathy with media, like there are infinite ways to create a, um, art with different tools. So it's certainly not enough to just grab your camera and place it in a refugee camp and think, now people are going to understand. If you don't have a strong connection to the character or if you don't have a compelling story to tell, then it's just like any other medium. It doesn't go to move you that much at all. So for all of you, if there are storytellers or for the ones who want to create empathy, if you want to connect people and uh, to decrease the, yeah, to, to make them, to, to open hearts, etc., then there are two things to take in mind. In a, in, yeah, two things. Think of what role is space, what role is space in the VR product, but think like theater. Perhaps sometimes it's another way of thinking. And if you want to change the world and your story is not good enough, then, then take my advice and start working with a storyteller because perhaps it will make more sense. That's it for now. We do several things at Dunk Lab, so that's the reason also when I I want to address those dates because we are designing a bra brand new festival with an exhibition, with live events, with a conference, a big, big conference. So please note that dates. You're more than welcome in Amsterdam. And also, um, I guess some of you also once participated at the Doc Lab Academy, Academy <laughs> for example. Uh, Doc Lab Academy is uh, during the ITFA festival and it's a new. It's a program for new talent in uh, documentary storytelling and interactive media. And it's got a kind of pressure cooker. You jump in the, into the world. There are so many international pioneers around. So actually, I think you all have to be there once. 
and you can apply till the 12th of September, so apply. Um, as I told you earlier tonight, um, I can't tell you much about the festival we are going to organize in Gant, but it's good to know it will be about social elements of virtual reality. So for all who did these, please tell them, please share them with us. And um, I will be around for the next few hours, so don't hesitate to talk or for all the good ideas or questions afterwards. Be brave and email me. Um, this is my company, Sophie and I, and uh, you can email us. We are always open for new ideas. So uh, that's it for now. This guy is Walter. Uh, I'll fill the gap so you don't have to introduce yourself. Um, there is uh, a, a show about gaming coming on television um, next month. No, this month, September. In two weeks only. It's on Capnet, it, it's with children. And they're also talking about, or they will also be talking about, two or three VR games. Um, so we had a big challenge in how to film the content because um, we don't only want to be looking at the guy wearing a glass and not being able to see what he's looking at. Um, and so we collaborated with Paul Drivé uh, to make this happen. And so Walter Arne, who is my colleague from PRT, will tell you about the technical issues and challenges. Thank you, Fredo. Uh, to start off, yeah, Pau is a really B2B company, so we are really into real estate, bringing real estate to life using 3D technology, so all computer generated images, but really real time. Uh, this is our company, if you want to look us up, visit the website, we are doing real estate, just B2B. But the story we want to tell you today is the story we collaborated with Fredo, other guys of VRT, with Arne, with uh, Joachim of Catnet as well. Uh, it's a story that started out just from the beginning. <coughs> uh, a couple of guys came to us to really experience the true VR. True VR as in HD, HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, room scale VR. And uh, you did some uh, experiments with 360s at the moment, but not really VR as a true VR. And then we started yeah, really discussing, okay, what can we do to transform the 3D environment onto just a screen, a flat screen, 2D screen, and how to transfer the 3D world on a 2D screen. And that's the really hard thing to do, to really transfer emotions, experience, on just a flat screen. The solution we came up through, it's not new, but we just tested out with the, the guys of VRT, is to mix the reality, so have multiple layers set up from the background, the person yourself and the tools you're handling in VR, and using that as a mixed reality. Uh, we explored that, uh, we made uh, setup just low-key at our uh, base, and then transferred it to Catnet, and that's for the next one. Uh, VR is for us, it's a new medium. You're really standing inside a new world, walking around in that world and creating your own environment, but transferring that to just a flat one, to TV stations or to a PC screen, it's really hard. And for now, the really uh, gap we have is that yeah, most of you have VR goggles, but if you see at the society, most of, yeah, just the viewers of IN or uh, Capnet, they don't have it. So it's really hard to express the emotion, the feeling you get in VR. So we must do it for now just by flat screens. And that's why uh, the layered uh, 2D presentation, mixed reality, is a solution. Uh, next, I'm going to give uh, the mic to Arne. Arne helped us uh, from our base, where we just used to having really good PCs with yeah, the 1080 graphical cards doing all the things just on software on our PC, but that transferred to 
the way you work in 2VRT with yeah, more analog, wiki, and mixing it all together. So Arne will uh, tell you more about the technical uh, aspects about the mixed reality, but also the problems we, we get in that, uh, that situation. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Arne Linus. I work here on, on VRT as a chief engineer and project manager for Kenneth. So when uh, Joachim van Dorne, our director from Kenneth, uh, approached me, yeah, we're going to do a, a show called Boof and the Games, and we're going to talk about gaming and stuff like that. Um, do you know what mixed reality is? Uh, no? Uh, so he gave me a goggle from the Vive. I was flabbergasted. It was amazing. So a new world opened for me. And um, he told me about mixed reality, and he showed me a little movie, and I'm going to show it at the end of my presentation. And um, yeah, that's what we are trying to do here for VRT. So we set up two tests. One, just a simple test, just like a, a proof of concept. And then we did a second test, which we filmed, and which will, will be um, showed in the show Boom and the Games. I cannot show you any uh, clips yet, because it still has to be edited. Uh, the clip what I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation <coughs> is actually made in post-production. So everything is filmed separately and afterwards um, put together in um, an editing cell. We are trying to do it live. So we're going to take a game, we're going to take, take players, and we're going to show it live. That's what we're about to do. So what we did, we took one Grinky studio, we took one hard to save eBay on an i7, Windows 10, graphic cards, etc. 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 We took a studio camera, we took a TV production room, and an extra VV controller, important, and a lot of victims. <laughs> so, um, maybe you know of the concept of a key fill signal? You know? In you all know it? Interesting to explain. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to explain. So you take on a green key or a blue screen, a room filled with a green or a blue walls, and you generate a black and white signal, it's called a key signal. And with the key, key signal, you can change what's white into something else, a background. Like in the game, you can change what's behind the person with the background of the game. The key fill signal can also be generated by a computer. So you take a green screen, <coughs> then you take a weather guy, in this instance Frank, and you fill all what's green with a chart. With a weather guy. And what you become is this. This is a key fill signal, it's very important. So how did we do the test? We took a green studio. We took my daughter, <laughs> um, and we took a third controller. Third controller acts as a virtual camera. So we mounted the third controller onto the camera, the real camera. The real camera filmed uh, my daughter in this case, and we changed the background with the background of the game. But it's a virtual world. So everything is 360. You also need some foreground. You have controllers with guns or something else of whatever. So you have to have a second key for the signal, which is generated by the gameplay computer. So in the end, you got something like this. You got a background, and you got a foreground, which is here not very good uh, to see. You cannot see it very good. Um, because we had some troubles in um, doing stuff. So the problems we had was matching the virtual camera with the real camera. Because it's a real camera, it's a virtual camera. We have the x, y, z axis, so you have the height, the width, and the depth. You have to control it, you have to match it together. So that's take us a long time to match this. But also the perspective, the perspective of the lens. 
You have a lens on a real camera, you have different type, types of lenses, but you don't have a lens in the virtual world. So how do you match it? When you zoom with your real lens, how can you zoom with your virtual camera? All problems we encountered. These are problems we took to a second test. And this was in a blue key studio, so <laughs> this was a blue one, bigger studio. Actually, you see here William Boover, he's the host of the game show. You see here the camera with a virtual, with a uh, third controller mounted on it. So, that's how we did the second test. In the end, we still had some issues and we're trying to solve them right now. How to put all the streams together out of the computer? You have three streams. You have the background, you have the foreground, and you have the key fill signal of the foreground. You have to match it together like layers. There are still several standards. Right, there are actually no standards yet. <laughs> so some um, games work with uh, chroma key, which does not work quite well because it's like a back or a, a, a black background. When you have something, when you hold something black in your foreground, you don't see it. So you cannot um, put it on screen because it's heat. Um, we also had the idea to read out the data from the, our lens and to put it inside the gameplay. So if there are any volunteers who are programming games, just shout. <laughs> um, and we also would like to try a second virtual camera because when you're in a live TV studio environment, you want to cut to another camera. So we have point of view one, and then you have to go to point of view two, otherwise, when you're sitting on the, when you're seeing one <coughs> image, is boring. And we have actually also wants to try uh, two videos in one virtual world. And why do we want to do that? Because we want to make a live game on TV. So we want to play with children on Catnet live on TV. It is also our ambition to um, create. Uh, virtual sets. And now the movie should come here, and the movie is not here. So this is uh, just a clip we um, we found on YouTube, and it's just a little demonstration of what mixed reality feels like. Um, this is made in post-production, so everything is filmed separately. We want to do this live. Themselves. Filming you in the green screen studio is just the best way we found to help everyone else understand what it's like to be in VR. Any questions? Can I go first? <laughs> All right, go crazy. So you see here, very good, the background and the foreground. You see fish swimming in front of the gameplay. That's a foreground image. 
you have to create um, a field key signal for the foreground also. It's burn. <laughs> 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 it's quite spectacular when you see this. So mixed reality is actually a, a good way to um, convince the audience of the possibilities of VR. Oh, So we did uh, two games with uh, Move and the Games. Uh, it was Fantastic Contraption and uh, Space Pirate Trainer. So um, it was a better game. So um, I want to do a little bit of appeal to people who are programming games. Um, when you program games, please make sure, or please adapt, pretty please, to um, make the, the fill key signal for your uh, foreground to, to incorporate it inside the game and do it properly with a good fill key signal and not with a chroma key. And also people who are, um, want to experiment with lens data and to incorporate the virtual camera to real life camera, please shout. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to I just want to point out that at this point this is a really technical collaboration, but imagine we will be able to do all the ambitions we have seen here, to do mixed reality live and to open it up to different people, and maybe do it on a web-based platform. People in classes, classrooms, for example, could join in in virtual shows, in real shows with a virtual camera. And we as a broadcaster could use VR in a completely different way. So I think this is a really huge step for us. And I'm anxious to see the show. Juan, who's next? I have oh, no Marie. idea. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, thinks, who thinks he's next? You guys. Yeah. There, who is next? Do you have some next Do you guys connect to your laptop? Oh, you do a tap dancing? Okay, we need a we have a USB key. Yeah. Very cool. Maybe some yes. question, no? Okay, who has impressive. questions? We have uh, two minutes for questions. Raise your hand. Don't be shy. One. Okay, go for it. So, as a key output, you basically want a black and white signal in the game. Like, black and white screen uh, yes. as a key. Yes. Okay, doing that. So, when you <laughs> take the, the foreground, yeah. the image of the foreground, yeah. like the gun and stuff like that, mm -hmm. Just do a black and white key when the, the white is what you want to pass through. Yeah. And the black is the silhouette of the organ. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Over there. I was wondering how they did the foreground because if you have one layer with black and white and the foreground is as well black and white, you don't have black. So the foreground is in color. Yeah. Foreground okay. is just the guns and or the games or the, the, the ball or whatever you're playing with. But the black and white signal just gives the information of what's yeah. going to be yeah. passed through and whatnot. Yeah. So when you have your first layer, the, the video mixer knows okay, the black silhouette has to be the, the, the foreground and the white has to be the the background. But in the background you're also making a mix between your green key 
and the background. So it's actually two fill key signals you're mixing together. And what about the lighting? If you're in the dark, in the real world, and the person is just shaking the door together, the adjustment? So just to make the point, so if the, if, if the person is in a dark environment in VR, you can't add a filter and play around it. The, the, the problem is you need lighting. For your blink, you have to have a very smooth lighting. It's also quite difficult. But Maybe it's a point we have to incorporate inside the gameplay when you use it. Okay, one more question over there. Yeah. I haven't quite got into the book to figure out how it works, but I believe that the Steam VR asset level in Unity comes with a script that outputs four images. Yes. But the the four outputs are a quad split. Yeah. So you have one HD signal. With four screens, you have the, the point of view of the viewer, you have your key field signal, if there is any, the foreground signal, and your background signal. What we want to do is to bring up the three signals we need, the background, the foreground, and the field signal, separately. So when you have, you, then you can have them in good quality. When you have them on crossfit, you have to cut them out, and then the frames don't match and stuff like that. So that all, we're all difficulties we encounter. We could do a workshop, especially about this later on, because I, I see that there's a lot of interest. Um, people, yeah. Many people are interested, so my, we course. might do a workshop, especially on this. Uh, on this that, would, that would be awesome, mm -hmm. and then allow people to, to you know do it together. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. you know bloggers are extremely interested into you know having their own setup and then try that out. Absolutely. Some people have the brewing VR case. <laughs> you know, it could become just like karaoke. <laughs> You know, social thing where you go with your friend, gather one plays, and the other one sort of uh, sort of play um, around. I um, also did some setups, but not with this setup, but with other uh, stuff. But we um, incorporated the data from the 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 the, 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 the tripod. Tripod. That you have the x y axis. Uh -huh. So when you can read out that data, incorporate it with the lens data. Then we can also make some virtual um, uh, virtual stuff inside the, the, the image. Like maybe you've seen um, recently on um, uh, here for the um, Olympic Games, we have uh, we had a journal about the Olympic Games. And we had a virtual decor, a virtual element inside the decor, or a virtual picture. And your um, host can walk behind it and stuff like that. So it would be nice when the data from the lens and uh, position you don't have to be have to the, the, the virtual camera, but the lens data would be extremely helpful. ILM, ILM solved the problem 30 years ago with the uh, walls, not the camera, the walls. Mm -hmm. There's a hidden way. <laughs> I saw already some things because uh, 20 years ago I already did some, uh, already did some advertising on football pitches when the, the center piece of the football pitch drops and the banner of <laughs> famous uh, beer <laughs> came in front of the...